What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Uchiha and Uzumaki Hybrid? Part 10. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. The sun hung high in the sky, casting sharp shadows across the village gates as Renjiro stood waiting for his squad. His usual calm demeanor was laced with a hint of contemplation. I need to do something about my appearance, he thought. His red hair and distinctive features were unmistakable markers of his identity, making anonymity a challenge. Other than Kushina and his late father, Renjiro had never seen anyone else with red hair. Should I cut it? No, that wouldn't suffice, at least for this mission. Considering the current situation, I'll need to completely change my appearance, he concluded. As these thoughts played through his mind, Kudo arrived, his expression respectful yet curious. Renjiro-sama, he greeted, bowing slightly. Renjiro acknowledged him with a nod, offering a rare smile. Good to see you, Kudo. How's patrolling the village been? Renjiro asked, striking up a casual conversation. The question was more than just small talk. It was a subtle way of gauging the morale and state of readiness within the squad. Kudo shrugged lightly, a relaxed smile on his face. It's been quiet, mostly. A few minor disturbances, but nothing we couldn't handle. It's given me some time to work on my sensory skills, though. That's good to hear, Renjiro responded. As they spoke, the other four squad members arrived in quick succession. They all greeted Renjiro with respectful nods and a few murmured greetings, standing in a loose semicircle around him. Are you all ready? Renjiro asked. The question was simple, yet it conveyed a deeper meaning. The mission details had been kept vague, emphasizing the need for preparedness and adaptability. I haven't even told them what the mission is, but we agreed that they should be prepared for anything, so I am sure they will be fine. Renjiro thought. We're ready, Tora spoke for the group, his voice steady. The others nodded in agreement, their eyes fixed on Renjiro, waiting for the mission brief. Renjiro took a deep breath, crossing his arms as he looked at each of them. Our mission is an escort. We're to safely escort the Fire Daimyo's son to Tanagur, the village hidden in the valleys in the Land of Rivers. He paused, letting the information sink in. This is a high-profile mission, and we must be vigilant at all times. Akira was the first to voice a question. Are there any known threats or groups we should be aware of? Renjiro nodded. Intelligence suggests the possibility of rogue ninja or bandits. We can't rule out more organized threats either, given the daimyo's position. Our priority is to get the boy to Tanagakir safely, without drawing unnecessary attention. Mickey frowned thoughtfully. Do we have any information on the terrain we'll be traveling through? The route will take us through a mix of forest and river valleys. It's relatively straightforward, but we need to be cautious of ambush points or anything else, Renjiro explained, appreciating her attention to detail. Tora, looking slightly confused, thought, then shouldn't he have told us this earlier? Renjiro smiled as he saw Tora's face. Part of the mission is to test our ability to adapt to changing circumstances. You should always be prepared for anything. Before they set off, Renjiro reached into his bag and pulled out a set of plain white animal masks, handing one to each of them. You will need to wear these, he instructed. The masks were simple, ordinary, and designed to obscure their identities. The squad members exchanged puzzled glances as they took the masks. Mickey's thoughts mirrored the confusion on their faces. 
Are we taking on an ANBU mission? She wondered. The masks were reminiscent of the ones used by the elite ANBU Black Ops, though less distinctive. As they donned their masks, Renjiro activated the transformation jutsu, his appearance shifting. His red hair turned jet black, and he seemed to grow taller. The transformation was subtle yet effective, altering his look enough to avoid easy recognition. Kudo, adjusting his mask, couldn't help but ask, Why the disguise, Renjiro-sama? Renjiro's eyes, now a darker hue, glanced at him. Just in case, he replied cryptically, offering no further explanation. His answer left Kudo and the others curious and slightly uneasy, but they knew better than to press the matter. Just in case what? Kudo thought, but he quickly refocused, reminding himself of the task ahead. With their disguises in place, the squad set off from the village gates, their pace brisk and steady. The journey to the capital of the Land of Fire was uneventful, the familiar landscape passing by in a blur of green and brown. It took them two hours to reach the capital, a bustling city where the power and wealth of the fire country were most evident. As they approached the grand estate of the fire daimyo, they were quickly ushered through the gates by the vigilant guards, their disguised presence causing no small amount of curiosity and suspicion. They were led to a spacious reception room, where a middle-aged man with an air of authority awaited them. His robes were richly embroidered, and he bore a striking resemblance to the young boy standing beside him, who looked no older than twelve. The boy had an expression of curiosity and a hint of apprehension, clearly aware of the importance of the situation. The man, whom they recognized as the daimyo, greeted them with a nod. Welcome. I trust you are the team assigned to escort my son to Tanagur. Renjiro stepped forward, bowing slightly. Yes, Daimyo-sama. We are here to ensure his safe passage. Good. I trust your village has chosen its best for this task. Renjiro nodded confidently. We will not disappoint, Daimyo-sama. The Daimyo turned to his son, placing a hand on the boy's shoulder. This is my son, Akihiko. I trust you will keep him safe. Akihiko looked at the masked figures with wide eyes, clearly both intrigued and nervous. We will protect him with our lives, Renjiro replied. It was a bit cringe, even for him, but Renjiro felt that he should say it because this was the fire daimyo after all. As they prepared to leave the daimyo's estate, Renjiro had a brief conversation with the head guard who was also going to accompany them. He was a stern man with graying hair and a vigilant gaze. We appreciate your assistance, he said, his voice steady. Our orders are to keep the young master safe, and your presence adds a valuable safeguard. Renjiro nodded, his expression calm. We'll stay out of sight, but we'll be nearby. If anything happens that you can't handle, we'll step in. The head guard acknowledged this with a curt nod. Understood. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Well, it doesn't hurt to be cautious, Renjiro mused, reflecting on the daimyo's decision to enlist Kanoha's help. If I were in the same position, I would do the same. With the arrangements made, the convoy departed the capital, heading south toward Tanagakir. The route they took was well-traveled but not without its risks. The Land of Rivers, a place of shifting alliances and hidden dangers, was known for its unpredictable terrain and occasional rogue elements. I am even surprised Iwat allowed me to take this mission with the way they wanted me to only take missions in countries that are allied with Kanoha. Renjiro thought. As they traveled, Renjiro and his squad maintained a discreet distance behind the daimyo's entourage. They stayed just within earshot, close enough to intervene if necessary, but far enough to remain unseen. The journey was uneventful at first, the only sounds being the rustle of leaves and the soft footfalls of the guards and shinobi. As they crossed into the land of rivers, the terrain began to change. The forests grew denser, and the paths more winding. It was then that Kudo caught up to Renjiro. Leaning in close, he whispered, Renjiro-sama, a group is approaching us. They're keeping their distance for now, but they're closing in. 
Renjiro didn't show any signs of surprise. His expression remained calm, his voice steady as he replied, I know. He had sensed the group earlier, their presence a subtle disturbance in the otherwise tranquil surroundings. He had decided not to act immediately, opting instead to observe and assess the situation. We'll only interfere if the daimyo's guards can't handle them. For now, just erase your chakra signatures and prepare yourselves, Renjiro instructed his squad. His words were met with silent nods as the squad members followed the directive. This ensured they could remain undetected, even by seasoned sensors, until the moment they chose to reveal themselves. Ahead, the convoy moved at a steady pace. The guards scanned their surroundings with keen eyes. Their hands rested close to their weapons, ready to spring into action at the first sign of trouble. The young daimyo's son, Akihiko, sat inside a luxurious carriage, occasionally peering out with a mixture of curiosity and boredom. Akihiko was blissfully unaware of the potential danger lurking in the shadows, his innocence a stark contrast to the seasoned guards surrounding him. Haven't they realized it yet? Renjiro wondered as he observed the convoy's guards. Despite their vigilance, there wasn't much change in their actions, suggesting they had yet to sense the impending threat. As the convoy ventured deeper into the land of rivers, the atmosphere grew more oppressive. The usual sounds of wildlife had faded away, replaced by an eerie silence. Then it swiftly happened. From the shadows of the trees, a group of rogue ninja emerged, their movements swift and precise. Renjiro could tell at a glance that these were not mere bandits. They were skilled shinobi, their formation and approach displaying a high level of training that you wouldn't expect bandits to have. Formation. The head guard of the convoy reacted immediately, shouting. The guards moved in unison, forming a protective circle around the carriage. The rogue shinobis were armed and ready, but they hadn't made any overtly aggressive moves yet. The head guard stepped forward, his voice firm as he demanded, State your business. This is a convoy of the fire daimyo. Identify yourselves. Renjiro's eyes narrowed as he observed the head guard's approach. Why is he doing that? Or is he that confident because we are here? He wondered if the guard's willingness to negotiate was born out of a genuine desire to avoid conflict or misplaced confidence in the unseen support from his squad. The leader of the rogue ninja, a tall figure with a prominent scar running across his face, stepped forward. His eyes were cold and calculating. We have no quarrel with you, he said, his voice low and even. We're here for the boy. Hand him over, and no one gets hurt. The head guard's resolve did not waver. You will not lay a hand on the young master, he declared, drawing a kunai with steely determination. The rest of the guards followed suit, weapons at the ready. The rogue ninja leader smirked, clearly unimpressed by the display of defiance. Very well, he said, his voice dripping with disdain. Have it your way. With a swift motion, he signaled his comrades, and the attack began. The rogue shinobis moved with deadly precision, launching a coordinated assault on the daimyo's guards. Steel clashed against steel, the air filled with the sharp sounds of combat and the crackling energy of jutsus being used. The guards fought valiantly, but it quickly became apparent they were outnumbered and at a disadvantage. They were up against close to 50 enemies, while they numbered only 12. Renjiro watched intently as he said, Get ready, just as the guard seemed to be faltering, Renjiro made his decision. With a swift hand signal, his squad joined the fray. Renjiro, wielding a saber, moved through the chaos with deadly grace. He had chosen this weapon deliberately, hoping it would help safeguard his identity. His squad followed his lead, their movements synchronized and efficient. They struck with precision, their training and experience evident in every action. The rogue ninja leader, noticing the new arrivals, shouted in surprise, Who are you? His voice was a mix of confusion and anger, clearly taken aback by the sudden appearance of the masked figures. Death, Renjiro replied coldly, his voice cutting through as he lunged at the leader, his saber aimed to incapacitate him. 
However, to his astonishment, the figure dissolved into water, revealing itself to be a mere clone. What? Renjiro thought, momentarily caught off guard. It was a clever ruse however, Renjiro didn't dwell on it. He quickly shifted his focus to the next target, ensuring the battle's momentum stayed in their favor. The skirmish was brief but intense. The rogue ninja, outmatched and overwhelmed, quickly realized they were no match for Renjiro's team. One by one, they were killed. The daimyo's guards, emboldened by the arrival of the Kanoha shinobi, rallied and supported their allies, ensuring a swift end to the confrontation. As the dust settled, their leader was nowhere to be seen which bothered Renjiro a lot. Did he escape? He wondered. The daimyo's guards quickly secured the area, ensuring there were no lingering threats. Akihiko, who had been safely shielded in the carriage, emerged, his eyes wide with shock and awe. The young boy looked around, trying to comprehend the sudden violence and its abrupt end. Renjiro approached the young boy. He crouched down to Akihiko's level, his voice gentle but firm. Are you all right? He asked. Akihiko nodded, clearly shaken but unharmed. Yes, thank you, he murmured, his voice trembling slightly. Despite the fear in his eyes, there was no visible harm to him. The masked shinobi had appeared out of nowhere, rescuing him from a situation he barely understood. Renjiro gave a reassuring smile, though it was hidden behind his mask. You're safe now. Let's continue our journey. He stood up, signaling to his squad to regroup. The convoy quickly reorganized, the guards more vigilant than ever. The atmosphere was tense but relieved, the danger a stark reminder of the challenges they faced. As they continued their journey, Renjiro couldn't shake the lingering doubt in his mind. Was that just a safeguard measure? He wondered, considering the possibility that the leader had anticipated interference and planned accordingly. The presence of a clone suggested a level of preparedness that was unsettling. My gut feeling is telling me that there's more to this. That wasn't just him being cautious. Renjiro thought. The rest of the journey passed without incident, the convoy moving at a steady pace towards Tanagakir. Akihiko was to attend a ceremony, a significant event that would take several weeks, so there was no need for them to stay there as the mission's objective was just to ensure his safe arrival and then leave his security to the villagers of Tanagakir. They were well aware that any harm coming to the fire daimyo's son would lead to severe repercussions, potentially even war with the land of fire, which was something both parties involved did not want. As the convoy entered Tanagakir, Renjiro and his squad maintained their discreet presence, ensuring Akihiko's safe passage into the village. Once the young master was settled in, Renjiro approached the head of the village's guard. They exchanged a few words, confirming the arrangements for Akihiko's stay and security. As Renjiro and his squad departed from Tanagakir, he detected something with his chakra field. Again, Renjiro thought, a mixture of irritation and concern surfacing in his mind. The mission had been successfully completed, yet it seemed their troubles were far from over. Renjiro's mind raced as he processed the situation. Once might have been normal, but twice? I refuse to believe this is just a coincidence. And from their chakra signatures, they are stronger than the ones we encountered on our way to Tanagakir. I can sense multiple Chunins and a Jounin. This is no ordinary force. His thoughts churned as he quickly considered their next move. There was no time to waste, the enemy's strength and numbers demanded a swift and decisive response. The squad leader came to an abrupt stop atop a sturdy tree branch, causing the other five behind him to halt as well. Those unfamiliar with sensory techniques looked around in confusion, unsure of what had prompted the sudden pause. However, Kudo and Mickey, who were also censors, quickly understood the gravity of the situation. In a low voice, Renjiro instructed, Be ready. We have enemies approaching from the west. They have a Jounin, so we will use formation for. As soon as Renjiro finished speaking, the squad members nodded in unison. In an instant, they disappeared into the trees, flickering toward the west where their enemies lay in wait. 
Meanwhile, Sasiki, the leader of the approaching rogue shinobi, felt a knot of anxiety tightening in his chest. I just hope the intel was right. The fact that they cannot determine the power levels and identities of the team from Kanoha is unnerving. But they can't have more than one Jown in present, he thought, trying to calm his nerves. He had been informed that the Kanoha squad had left Tanagakure a few hours earlier, and his task was to intercept them before they exited the Land of Rivers. I just hope they're using the same route, he mused. Sasiki's frustration simmered just below the surface. The earlier mission to abduct the daimyo's son had been a failure, largely due to the intervention from Kanoha shinobis. Their intervention had not only thwarted the kidnapping but also resulted in significant losses for their forces. Now I am tasked with cleaning up Kata's mess, he thought bitterly. The plan was to attack the Kanoha squad on their return journey, masking their true intentions under the guise of normal bandit activity in the area. While this might complicate future plans to abduct Akihiko, it was a necessary risk to avoid alarming the daimyo and potentially sparking a larger conflict. They could always find another opportunity or another target. Turning to one of his subordinates, a sensory shinobi, Sasiki asked, Are they close? The censor, a young woman, shook her head. I still can't sense them, she replied. Sasiki frowned, muttering under his breath, I wonder why they're so slow. His words were barely out when a thunderous explosion shattered the relative quiet of the forest. Boom! The ground shook, and the air filled with the acrid scent of burning foliage and the metallic tang of blood. One of Sasiki's men shouted, We're under attack! Panic spread through the rogue group as they scrambled to understand what was happening. Sasiki's eyes widened in shock. What is this? Their censor had assured him that the Kanoha squad was still far off. Yet here they were, under sudden and violent assault. He turned to glare at the censor, who looked equally bewildered. Did they conceal their presence? He barely had time to process the thought before the masked figures of Renjiro's squad descended upon them. The rogue shinobi were roughly the same number as the group that had attacked the convoy earlier, but these were clearly more powerful. Renjiro's squad wasted no time with pleasantries or negotiations. They moved with lethal efficiency, each member taking on multiple opponents. Tora, wielding his twin swords with deadly precision, cut down enemies with swift, brutal strikes. However, as he began to face Chunin among the group, Tora started to tire. It seems I need to use that, he thought grimly. Without warning, Tora channeled his remaining chakra into a desperate, final attack. His body glowed with an intense light before exploding in a brilliant burst of energy. The explosion was massive, sending shockwaves through the forest and obliterating the enemies surrounding him. Similar scenes unfolded where Mickey and Akira fought. They, too, resorted to explosive techniques, causing significant damage and chaos among the rogue shinobi ranks. Sasiki's frustration boiled over into rage. He had just closed in on one of the masked figures when they exploded. Suddenly, he felt the cold steel of a blade coming near his shoulder. Instinctively, he leaned back, avoiding the strike by a hair's breadth. He quickly put distance between himself and his assailant, his eyes narrowing as he took in the sight of a masked figure standing before him. The figure's stance was calm and composed, a stark contrast to the chaos around them. The figure tilted their head slightly, as if assessing Sasiki. Who are you? Sasiki demanded, his voice edged with anger and fear. The masked figure remained silent, the only response a subtle shift in their posture. Damn it, Sasiki thought, tightening his grip on his kunai. Sasiki, feeling the weight of the situation bearing down on him, lunged at the masked figure before him. The two engaged in a fierce exchange, their movements a blur of speed and precision. Sasiki's strikes were powerful and relentless, but the masked figure parried each one with ease. I need to find a way to get out of this situation, Sasiki thought desperately, his eyes darting around, searching for an opening. But Renjiro was relentless, his movements precise and efficient, leaving Sasiki no room to escape. Sasiki barely managed to parry a slash aimed at his midsection, 
the force of the blow sending him stumbling back. He knew he was running out of options, and his mind raced with the possibility of defeat. In a swift and decisive move, Renjiro made his move. With a flick of his wrist, he produced a series of seals from his pouch. Sasiki's eyes widened in realization, but it was too late. Renjiro darted forward, closing the distance between them in an instant. Sasiki tried to defend himself, but Renjiro was too quick. With a series of fluid motions, Renjiro slapped nearly a dozen seals onto Sasiki's body. The seals glowed momentarily before sinking into Sasiki's skin, and he felt a sudden, overwhelming sensation of paralysis. Sasiki's body seized up, his muscles locking in place. He couldn't move, couldn't speak. Panic surged through him as he realized he was utterly incapacitated. Renjiro had used advanced paralysis and chakra draining seals, rendering Sasiki completely helpless. The rogue shinobi fell to the ground with a thud, unable to move a muscle. His eyes darted around wildly, the only part of him that could still move, as he tried to make sense of what had just happened. How? He wondered. We need to interrogate him, Renjiro thought, knowing that Sasiki could hold valuable information. Without a word, Renjiro hoisted the paralyzed Jounin over his shoulder and made his way back to where Kudo was waiting. I have dealt with their leader, you can deal with the rest, if anything happens, you can let me know, Renjiro said as he approached Kudo. He then set Sasiki down and dispelled himself. This was the Formation 4 that Renjiro had talked about. He and the rest of the squad members who had engaged the rogue shinobi were nothing more than shadow clones. This was a strategy devised to deal with dangerous situations like suicide bombers. It was a formation that relied on the use of shadow clones, each clone capable of performing a shadow clone explosion. This jutsu had been a mandatory skill for the squad, one that Renjiro had insisted everyone master, including himself. The real Kudo had been with the clones, acting as a safeguard in case they needed to secure someone for questioning. The plan was simple, if nothing happened on the way back to Kanoha, Renjiro and the rest would regroup with Kudo and swiftly return to the village. However, if an attack occurred, they would stay back in Tanagakir, protecting Akihiko from potential threats. As the clones dispelled themselves, the memories and information flooded into Renjiro's real body. Now we have another person to interrogate. Renjiro said as he stood over a person who he incapacitated with his seals just as he did to Sasiki. The only difference was that he needed fewer seals as this person was just a guard in the convoy that was escorting Akihiko. By the time Kudo and the Shadow Clones left Tanagakir, the evening sky had settled into a deep indigo, speckled with the first stars of the night. Traveling at night posed no significant challenge for them especially since their pace could now increase without the young daimyo's son, Akihiko, to worry about. The darkness provided cover, allowing them to move swiftly and silently through the night. The distance between Tanagakir and the border of the Land of Rivers was quite significant. Hours passed before Sasiki and his group intercepted Kudo and the Shadow Clones. Meanwhile, as Renjiro and the rest of the squad remained behind in Tanagakir, their presence was undetected even by Akihiko's convoy. It was not particularly difficult for them to stay hidden, given their skills and experience. They blended seamlessly into the shadows, their senses attuned to any potential threat. If nothing happens after a day, then I guess we will go back to the village. There won't be a need to waste both the squads and my time, Renjiro thought as they decided to monitor the situation regarding Akihiko. Tanagakir was a bustling village, and they had welcomed several high-ranking nobles of similar standing to Akihiko. The security was tight, though not as stringent as Renjiro would have preferred. If we can move undetected, then it means that other people can also do so, Renjiro thought, a sense of unease settling over him. Then it happened. Dead in the night, one of the guards from Akihiko's convoy attempted to assassinate the young master. Renjiro and his team, ever vigilant, acted swiftly. The would-be assassin was immobilized within moments, his weapon clattering to the ground with a metallic thud. Renjiro's eyes narrowed as he regarded the immobilized guard. 
Check whether he is under some sort of genjutsu, he instructed Akira. The rest of you, secure the area while I raise the alarm. Akira nodded, her Sharingan activated as she began to examine and interrogate the guard. The rest of the squad fanned out, their eyes scanning the surroundings for any additional threats. Renjiro moved quickly, his footsteps silent as he made his way to inform the head guard from the convoy and the one in charge of security in Tanagakir. The head guard from the Land of Fire was surprised to see Renjiro and his squad still in Tanagakir. Renjiro-sama, I thought you had left, he said, his voice tinged with confusion. Renjiro gave a brief nod. I had a hunch that something would happen to the young master, he explained. The head guard's eyes widened in understanding, a newfound respect shining in his gaze. I see. Your foresight may have saved the young master's life. We owe you a great debt, the head guard said, his voice filled with gratitude. Renjiro nodded curtly, acknowledging the compliment. Ensure that the rest of the convoy is secure. We need to be prepared for any further attempts, he advised. They then went to do other preparations after informing the concerned parties, including the team in charge of security in Tanagakir, Renjiro quickly returned to his squad as the head guard informed his superiors the rest of the convoy guards were now on high alert. Renjiro wanted to interrogate them to ensure that there weren't any more spies in their ranks but he quickly shot that idea down. If we can both interrogate the two people we caught then we can fish them out. While the guard might not know if there are other spies present, that other guy in Kudo's custody might know. Renjiro thought. As Renjiro approached, he could see Akira still interrogating the guard. What did you find out? Renjiro asked, his tone brisk. Akira looked up, her Sharingan deactivated. He's not under any Genjutsu, she reported. But after a brief interrogation, I discovered he is a spy for a local group of rogue shinobi who wanted to kidnap Akihiko but after they failed, they decided to kill him. Renjiro's eyes narrowed as he processed this information. So, it wasn't just an assassination attempt. They wanted to kidnap him, he mused, his mind racing with the implications. We need to secure him. Killing him would be easier, but it would bring more issues as he is our best shot at proving what happened. Renjiro said as he looked at the dazed guard. He was still under Akira's genjutsu. With a swift movement, Renjiro planted a seal on the guard, ensuring that he would be unable to escape even if he managed to break out of the genjutsu. Just as he was about to give further instructions, memories flooded into his mind from the shadow clone that was with Kudo. The sudden influx of information was a bit disorienting, but Renjiro quickly regained his composure. He saw the battle, felt the intensity of the fight, and experienced the capture of Sasiki, the rogue Jounin. The memories provided valuable insight, and Renjiro knew they needed to act on this information swiftly. He turned to his squad, his voice calm and authoritative. We've captured the leader of the rogue Shinobi. Kudo is securing him now. When Kudo arrived with Sasiki in tow, they quickly decided to interrogate him to compare notes with what they got from the guard. He might have valuable information about their plans and the organization behind these attacks. Kudo nodded, stepping aside to allow Renjiro to take the lead. Renjiro knelt down beside Sasiki, his eyes meeting the rogue shinobis. You have two choices, Renjiro began, his tone cold. You can cooperate, and we'll ensure you are treated fairly or you can resist, and things will get much worse for you. Sasiki's eyes flickered with defiance, but he remained silent. Renjiro sighed, knowing that this would not be easy. He signaled to Akira, who stepped forward, her Sharingan activating once more. Let's see if we can get you to talk, Akira said, her voice soft but menacing. She locked eyes with Sasiki, and within moments, the rogue Jounin's resistance began to crumble. The Sharingan's power was undeniable, and Sasiki found himself unable to resist its influence. Slowly, painfully, Sasiki began to talk. He revealed the plans of his group, their intentions to kidnap Akihiko, and the broader conspiracy at play. 
Tell us about the organization behind you, she demanded. Sasiki's face twisted with pain and defiance. I can't. He gasped, his breath coming in ragged bursts. The struggle was evident in his eyes, the internal battle between his will and whatever force was preventing him from speaking. Renjiro's eyes narrowed, noticing something strange. Black lines began to form on Sasiki's face, creeping across his skin like a sinister web. What is that? Renjiro wondered, alarm bells ringing in his mind. Akira pressed on, her voice firm. Who are you working for? What are their plans? Sasiki's mouth opened and closed, but no words came out. His eyes bulged with terror and agony, the black line spreading rapidly. The squad watched in shock as his body convulsed violently. Renjiro's heart raced. Stop! Akira, stop the interrogation! He ordered, his voice sharp. Akira immediately ceased her questioning, but it was too late. Sasiki's body stiffened, and with one final shudder, he collapsed, lifeless. The black lines receded slightly, leaving his face pale and contorted. Tora and Mickey rushed over, their faces pale with horror. What just happened? Tora asked, his voice tinged with disbelief. Renjiro knelt beside Sasiki's body, examining the black lines closely. That's Juin Justu, he said grimly. A curse mark. He wasn't allowed to talk about the organization behind him. The mark killed him the moment he tried to reveal anything. The squad fell silent, the weight of the revelation settling over them like a dark cloud. Renjiro's mind raced, piecing together the implications of what they had just witnessed. I guess this was not Danzo's original idea, he thought. Finally, Mickey's voice broke the silence. So they would rather have their operatives die than risk revealing any information about their plans? Renjiro nodded slowly. It seems that way. Whatever we're dealing with, it's far more dangerous and organized than we initially thought. Akira's Sharingan faded, her eyes returning to their normal state. What do we do now? She asked, her voice steady but laced with concern. Renjiro stood up, his expression resolute. We first inform the daimyo's guards, then go back to the village. This information needs to be reported to the village immediately. He began, since we have thwarted their plans twice and even managed to catch their spies and one of their leaders, they are less likely to make any more attempts at Akihiko's life. Though the threat is still far from over. They nodded as Renjiro made his way to Fumio, the head guard of Akihiko's convoy. He needed to inform Fumio of this latest development and discuss their next steps. Reaching the head guard's quarters, Renjiro knocked firmly on the wooden door. It creaked open to reveal Fumio, his expression tired but alert. Renjiro, what news do you bring? Fumio asked, stepping aside to let him in. Renjiro entered the room, noting the sparse furnishings that reflected Fumio's pragmatic nature. We interrogated Sasiki, Renjiro began, his tone grave. But he died before he could reveal any useful information. It seems he was bound by a curse mark, a Juinjustu, that prevented him from speaking about his organization. Fumio's brows knitted in concern. That is indeed troubling. If they were just common bandits, it wouldn't be a huge issue, but this indicates a far more organized and dangerous group. Renjiro nodded. Have you informed your superiors about the assassination attempt? Fumio sighed, running a hand through his hair. Yes, I have. And I've already received a response. Renjiro's eyes widened in surprise. Already? It has just been a few hours. I wonder how he has informed them. He definitely did not use birds because they would take more time to send the message, let alone get a reply. Seeing the look on his face, Fumio immediately recognized it and gave a wry smile. I know what you are thinking, don't worry, the daimyo's court has its ways. We utilize a special technique for rapid communication. The response I received was immediate. Renjiro nodded, absorbing this new information. 
What did they say? Fumio's expression turned serious. They are greatly concerned about the assassination attempt and the level of threat we are dealing with. They agree with our assessment that this is no ordinary group of bandits. Renjiro felt a mixture of relief and apprehension. The swift response indicated the seriousness of the situation, but it also meant that higher authorities were now closely watching their every move. That's good to hear. Coordination and support from the daimyo's court will be crucial. Fumio hesitated for a moment before speaking again. There's something else, Renjiro. After speaking with my superiors, I have a request to make of you. Renjiro raised an eyebrow. Go ahead. What is it? Fumio took a deep breath. My superiors have been impressed by your dedication and performance over the last few days. They have seen how effectively you handled the threats and protected young master Akihiko even after the objective of your mission ended. They are willing to offer you a position in the daimyo's court. Renjiro was taken aback. A position working for the daimyo? He repeated, surprise evident in his voice. His mind raced as he thought of how to respond politely yet firmly. Yes, Fumio confirmed. They believe someone with your skills and dedication would be a valuable asset to the court. Renjiro's thoughts churned. The offer was an honor, but he did not need to think twice about declining it. He immediately decided to decline the offer not because of his loyalty to Kanoha or his position in the police force, but because Renjiro had a plan. And the plan did not involve him residing anywhere else, at least for the foreseeable future. Another issue was that Renjiro could still not wrap his head around the feudal system in place. Shinobis were powerful but they were still tied down to the feudal system, something he did not subscribe to. Even if Renjiro decided to change his plans, which he had time to, he still wouldn't feel at peace with it since he would build some sort of resentment due to his radical views on the systems in place. This reminded Renjiro how despite being in this world for close to a decade, he still held some of the deep-rooted beliefs from his first life. Something that was weirdly comforting as well as frightening because he knew what was to come and what he needed to do to survive. I am truly honored by the offer, he began carefully. However, I am currently committed to serving in the Kanoha police force. My duties there are paramount. Fumio nodded, understanding in his eyes. I see. But would you consider the offer if your clan head Daichi or even the Hokage agreed to it? When he heard this, Renjiro quickly stopped the smirk that started to form in his mouth. If my clan head Daichi or the Hokage were to approve such a request, I would gladly go to the fire capital and serve there. Yeah, right as if either of them will agree to this. Renjiro immediately thought. Fumio smiled, accepting Renjiro's response. Understood. I will convey your sentiments to my superiors. He was pleased because Renjiro did not outrightly decline. There was still a chance that everything could work out if the Hokage agreed. Too bad, he is hopeful. He doesn't know that it is the hope that kills. Renjiro thought. With the conversation concluded, Renjiro prepared to leave. Before he could step out, Fumio added, One more thing. You need to surrender Sasiki's body and the guard to us. A team from the fire capital will be arriving in a few hours to take them into custody. Renjiro nodded. Of course. We will hand them over to you as soon as possible. With their business concluded, Renjiro returned to his squad, who were waiting patiently. We're handing over Sasiki's body and the guard to Fumio's team, he informed them. After that, we'll head back to Kanoha. The squad acknowledged the plan and began to prepare for the handover. When the team from the fire capital arrived, they conducted the transfer smoothly, ensuring every protocol was followed. Sasiki and the guard were taken away, and Renjiro felt a weight lift from his shoulders. With nothing left to do in Tanagakir, Renjiro and his squad began their journey back to Kanoha. The trip was uneventful, a stark contrast to the tense days they had just endured going to Tanagakir. The forest that had seemed so menacing before now felt like a protective cocoon as they made their way home. Once they reached Kanoha, Renjiro gathered his squad. 
You've all done exceptionally well, he praised. Take a day off and rest. You'll get your pay later. I'll go and give our mission report to Iwata-sama. The squad dispersed, eager for some rest and relaxation. Renjiro, however, headed straight to the administrative building to deliver his report. The morning sun cast a warm, golden light through the windows of Iwata's office, illuminating the room with a soft glow. Renjiro sat opposite Iwata, his posture relaxed but his mind still reeling from the events of the past few days. The mission had been anything but ordinary, and now, as he recounted the details to Iwata, he could see the concern growing on the older man's face. Iwata listened intently, his sharp eyes narrowing slightly as Renjiro detailed the ambushes, the assassination attempt, and the mysterious curse mark that had claimed Sasiki's life. He leaned back in his chair, fingers steepled as he absorbed the information. The mission was supposed to be an ordinary escort mission, a simple task to ensure the safe passage of the daimyo's son to Tanagakir. But it had turned into a complex and dangerous operation, revealing threats far beyond what anyone had anticipated. So that's what happened, Iwata said finally, his voice tinged with a contemplative edge. He tapped his fingers against the desk, a habit Renjiro had noticed when the man was deep in thought. This was supposed to be an ordinary escort mission, nothing more. But it seems things took a much more serious turn. Renjiro nodded, his expression serious. Yes, Iwata-sama. The use of a Juinjustu to silence Sasiki shows that they were part of a larger and more dangerous organization. Iwata sighed, rubbing his temples. I'm the one who chose this mission, or rather the ones where you picked it from. I didn't expect it would turn out this way. I should have been more cautious. Renjiro shook his head. There's no way you could have known, Iwata-san. We dealt with the threats as best as we could, and we managed to protect Akihiko-sama. That's what matters. Iwata smiled faintly, appreciating Renjiro's words. You did well, Renjiro. You and your team will get the right compensation for this mission. I'll make sure of it. Renjiro hesitated. He had been debating whether to tell Iwata about the offer from Fumio, the head guard. It wasn't something he had to disclose, but a part of him felt that being honest about it might help build trust between him and Iwata and the clan in general. After all, while it was not outrightly shown, Renjiro felt that his relationship with the clan was starting to falter, especially when he asserted his decision not to stay in the police force longer than the agreed time. Finally, he decided to go ahead. Iwata-san, there's something else I need to tell you. Iwata raised an eyebrow, his curiosity peaked. Go on. During our last conversation, Fumio Dano made an offer to me, Renjiro began, choosing his words carefully. He suggested that I could work directly for the daimyo. He said that his superiors were impressed with my performance and that they believed I could be an asset to the daimyo's court. Iwata's eyes widened slightly, a mixture of surprise and interest flashing across his face. A position in the daimyo's court? That's quite the offer. What did you say? Renjiro exhaled slowly. I declined the offer. I told Fumio Dano that I would only agree to it if either Daichi-sama or the Hokage allowed it. I felt that was the most respectful way to handle the situation. Iwata leaned back in his chair, clearly impressed. So you were honest with him about it? Yes, Renjiro confirmed. I thought it was important to be upfront, given the nature of the offer. I didn't want to give the impression that I was considering leaving Kanoha without proper approval. Iwata nodded slowly, a thoughtful look in his eyes. I appreciate your honesty, Renjiro. Renjiro smiled slightly, but there was a hint of unease in his eyes. Thank you, Iwata-san. To be honest, Kanoha has been my home ever since the fall of Yuzushio Gakure. I can't imagine leaving it before I've paid back everything the village has done for me. Iwata's gaze softened as he listened to Renjiro's words. Your loyalty to the village is admirable, Renjiro. But let me ask you this, 
Why did you tell Fumio Dano that you would only agree to work for the daimyo if Daichi-sama or the Hokage approved? Was it just a way to politely decline, or was there more to it? Renjiro paused, considering his response carefully. At first, it was just an excuse to decline the offer without offending Fumio Dano. But as I thought about it more, I realized that if either Daichi-sama or Lord Third agreed to it, I would follow their orders. It would still be a way of giving back to the village. Iwata leaned forward, his interest deepening. Do you believe they would approve such a request? Renjiro shook his head slightly. I don't think so. I believe that my worth and skills offer more value to the village than just working for the daimyo. Kanoha is where I belong, and where I can make the most difference. Iwata chuckled softly, nodding in agreement. It's good that you know your worth, Renjiro. And you're right, the village needs shinobi like you, dedicated and skilled. But I do wonder, should I relay this matter to Daichi-sama or the Hokage? Do you think it's something they should be made aware of? Renjiro considered the question carefully. If you believe it's necessary, Iwata-san, then by all means, inform them. But I'm confident that they would prefer I stay in Kanoha, serving the village as I've always done. Iwata regarded Renjiro with a mixture of respect and admiration. You've handled this situation well, Renjiro. Not many shinobi would have the presence of mind to navigate such an offer so tactfully. I'll think about whether to inform Daichi-sama or the Hokage, but for now, I believe it's safe to say that you'll continue to serve Kanoha in your current capacity. Renjiro bowed his head slightly. Thank you, Iwata-san. I'm grateful for your understanding. As Renjiro stood to leave, Iwata spoke again. Renjiro, one last thing. You've proven yourself time and again, not just as a capable shinobi, but as a leader and a protector of Kanoha's interests. I want you to know that I trust you implicitly. If ever you find yourself in a situation like this again, remember that you have the full support of the village. Renjiro nodded, feeling a deep sense of pride and responsibility. Thank you, Iwata-san. I won't forget it. As Renjiro stepped out of Iwata's office, Renjiro's mind was still occupied. What should I do next? He wondered, I'm not really that tired, Renjiro mused, considering how best to use the time. I should probably train for a couple of hours before resting. The idea of training felt like a good way to clear his mind. Physical exertion had always been his method of processing complex thoughts, and there was no shortage of jutsus he had to train. Just as Renjiro made up his mind, he turned a corner, still absorbed in his thoughts, and abruptly collided with something, or rather, someone. The impact was enough to jolt him out of his reverie, and he quickly steadied himself, blinking in surprise as he looked up. Renjiro, Miwa said, a faint smile tugging at the corners of her lips. You seem lost in thought. Where were you rushing off to? As Renjiro and Miwa walked through the bustling streets of Kanoha, the morning sun illuminated the village, casting a warm, golden hue on everything it touched. The sounds of merchants calling out their wares, children laughing as they played, and the rhythmic clatter of shinobi on patrol filled the air, creating a familiar and comforting atmosphere. Despite the crowd, Miwa and Renjiro easily navigated through, their presence parting the sea of villagers with the subtle authority that came with being members of the Uchiha clan. After a brief pause in their conversation, Miwa turned to Renjiro, a genuine smile lighting up her features. By the way, Renjiro, I never got the chance to properly congratulate you on becoming a squad leader. I know it's been a month already, but I've been away on missions. I'm proud of you. Renjiro looked up, a small smile forming on his lips at her words. Thank you, Miwa. It's been challenging, but rewarding. Miwa nodded thoughtfully, her eyes filled with pride. I'm sure it has been. Leading a squad is no easy task, especially at your age. How's the experience been so far? She asked her tone a mix of curiosity and genuine concern. Renjiro took a moment to gather his thoughts. It's been a lot of responsibility, 
he admitted. He then went on to tell him how he had been from the last time that they saw each other and even after he became a squad leader. Miwa listened intently. That's good to hear. It sounds like you're handling it well. You've always been strong, Renjiro, but I'm glad to see you growing into your role. Renjiro nodded. I've had a lot of help along the way. My squad has been great, supportive, and reliable. I couldn't have asked for better subordinates. A mischievous glint suddenly appeared in Miwa's eyes as she changed the subject. And what about your friends? Have you made more friends since recently? The question caught Renjiro off guard, and he blinked in surprise. He wasn't used to Miwa asking about his social life, especially not so directly. Miwa had always been a bit distant, not out of lack of care, but because of her own responsibilities that often took her away from the village. Despite this, Renjiro had never resented her for it. He understood the demands of being a shinobi. But now, her sudden interest in his friendships felt both surprising and oddly comforting. Why the sudden question? Renjiro asked, a bit alarmed by the shift in the conversation. He wasn't sure where this was leading, and the teasing look on Miwa's face didn't help his unease. It's not like you to ask about stuff like that. Miwa's smile grew wider. What? You aren't making friends? Is something wrong? She asked with a mock serious expression, clearly enjoying the way Renjiro was squirming under her questioning. Of course I'm making friends, Renjiro shot back, a little too quickly, his defensive tone making Miwa's smile widen even more. How many? Miwa asked, leaning in closer as if she was genuinely concerned, but her playful tone gave her away. Renjiro let out an exasperated sigh, giving her a deadpan look. Do you really want me to name all of my friends? He asked, knowing full well that Miwa wouldn't let him off the hook easily. If you had that many friends, it wouldn't be an issue, Miwa replied. Is she serious? He wondered, mentally preparing himself for what he knew would be an inescapable ordeal. Miwa could be incredibly persistent when she wanted to be, and Renjiro knew from experience that the only way to end this was to give in. Fine, Renjiro began, reluctantly listing off names. There's Aiko, Hiro, and Riku-sensei, of course. Then there's Sora, Kaito, Sama, Fu. Miwa's eyes lit up, Sama? Who's that? I've never heard you talk about her before. Renjiro instantly regretted mentioning that name. He knew how Miwa could exaggerate situations, especially when it came to teasing him. She's from the Namakes clan, Renjiro shrugged, trying to sound nonchalant. I recently went on a mission with her and her cousin Minato. He hoped that by downplaying it, Miwa would lose interest and move on to another topic. But Miwa wasn't about to let him off the hook that easily. Oh, so she's Minato's cousin, she began. Then tell me more. Renjiro resisted the urge to facepalm, knowing where this was headed. That's all there is to it. We met during the mission and became friends. He said, trying to keep his tone casual and dismissive. Miwa's smirk only grew wider. Oh really? I haven't seen you this happy when talking about someone before. Renjiro's mind went blank for a moment as he processed her words. What is she thinking? He wondered, trying to figure out how to steer the conversation away from this topic. But before he could come up with a plan, Miwa continued her teasing. You see, you're even blushing. Miwa teased, her voice filled with amusement. What? Renjiro felt a sudden warmth spread across his face, his cheeks reddening involuntarily. He couldn't believe this was happening. What the hell is happening to me? Damn these teenage hormones! He thought, feeling utterly betrayed by his own body. He didn't understand why he was reacting this way, but he knew he never wanted a repeat of this embarrassing situation. It's not what you think, Renjiro protested, his voice a little higher than he intended. He could feel his face burning, and the more he tried to deny it, the more he could see Miwa's amusement growing. Miwa laughed. Then I guess it's understandable. 
your mother was about your age when she met your father. She said, scratching her chin thoughtfully as if reminiscing about the past. Wait, Renjiro's mother was only 11 when she met his father. Was he a P.E. Dash? No, that is beside the point. Renjiro thought as he stared at Miwa wide-eyed and horrified. It's really not like that. He insisted, but his voice lacked the conviction he wished it had. He could tell that Miwa wasn't going to let this go, and it was clear that she was enjoying every moment of his discomfort. Miwa's laughter softened into a warm smile as she looked at her nephew, her eyes filled with a mixture of affection and nostalgia. Renjiro, it's okay. I'm just teasing you, she said, her tone gentle now. You're growing up, and it's natural to form connections with others. Whether it's friendships or something more, it's all part of life. Suddenly, Miwa asked, Are you currently busy, or do you have some time to spare? Renjiro glanced at her, Not really, I just came from giving a mission report to Iwata-sama. Miwa's eyes widened slightly in surprise. You just got back from a mission? She asked, seeking clarification. Renjiro nodded. Yeah, we returned not too long ago. And what are you planning to do now? She asked. I was thinking of doing some light training before getting some rest. He said. Miwa's eyes widened again, this time in shock. Training? After just coming back from a mission? Aren't you tired at all? Her voice was a mix of disbelief and worry. She knew Renjiro was strong and dedicated, but even she couldn't help but feel concerned about him pushing himself too hard. Renjiro shrugged, I feel fine. The mission wasn't too taxing, and I thought some light training might help me wind down. He said it as though it were the most logical thing in the world, but Miwa could hardly believe her ears. Well, if you're feeling that energetic, then I have something I want to show you. She said, her voice brimming with excitement. Renjiro looked at Miwa, his curiosity peaked as he tried to read her expression. What do you want to show me? He asked. His tone had a mix of curiosity and caution. Miwa merely smiled, turning away and beginning to walk ahead. Don't worry about that, just follow me. Renjiro hesitated for a moment, watching her as she disappeared around a corner. With a shrug, he decided to follow, his footsteps echoing slightly in the narrow, dimly lit corridor. Where is she taking me? He wondered, his thoughts swirling as they continued down the hallway. The corridor they were in seemed to stretch on forever, the faint sound of their footsteps the only noise in the otherwise silent space. Renjiro noted how the walls, once smooth and well-maintained, began to show signs of age and wear, the stone cracked in places, with moss creeping along the seams. Finally, they reached the end of the hallway, where a narrow stairwell descended further down. Without pausing, Miwa started down the stairs, her movements smooth and deliberate. Renjiro followed closely behind, his curiosity growing with each step they took. The stairwell was narrow, the walls closing in around them as they descended, the air thickening with the scent of damp stone and earth. At the bottom of the stairwell stood a massive, dingy double door, its surface marred with scratches and dents that spoke of years of use. It was clear this door had seen better days. I didn't even know this place existed, Renjiro thought, his brow furrowing as he took in the sight before him. The door was massive, easily twice his height, and looked like it belonged to an ancient fortress rather than a base hidden beneath the police force. Out of curiosity, Renjiro activated his chakra field. He wanted to see whether he would be able to get an inkling as to what Miwa wanted to show him. Immediately he did, Miwa shot him a knowing glance. But her catching on to what he was trying to do was not what concerned Renjiro. Renjiro could sense the chakra signatures of every being or object around, except for what was behind the door. It was like someone had cut off a section of his chakra field. Hmm. That is strange. Are they using a seal to block out sensing? No, that can't be. I have experimented with how my chakra field works every stealth seal I know of. Renjiro thought. While Renjiro had not mastered as many seals as he'd like to, 
he was aware of most and how they reacted with his surroundings. So this particular situation piqued his interest. He was aware that even if he had a thousand years to practice Fuenjutsu, he would never know of all the seals under the sun as Fuenjutsu was very broad, with countless ways to achieve it. It was kinda like programming with how various programming languages popped up every now and then. Miwa paused for a moment in front of the door, her hand resting on the rough wood. Without a word, she pushed it open, creak. The door groaned in protest as it swung inward, revealing a sight that took Renjiro completely by surprise. Beyond the door was a vast open space. It was enormous, much larger than he had expected, with various demarcated areas spread out across the floor. Each area was marked by thick lines of chalk or paint, separating them from one another. Some spaces were small, likely meant for one-on-one -on -one combat, while others were large enough to accommodate several fighters at once. Weapons of all kinds were scattered around the edges of the room, some leaning against the walls, others laid out on makeshift racks. Swords, kunai, shuriken, and even more exotic weapons like scythes and chains were all there, glinting faintly in the low light. The air was thick with the scent of sweat and steel, a combination that Renjiro recognized from countless training sessions, though this was somehow different, more intense. Renjiro's eyes widened as he took in the scene before him. He could see groups of shinobi sparring in the various spaces, their movements quick and precise, their faces set in expressions of intense focus. Some of the larger spaces had drawn crowds, and groups of onlookers gathered around to watch the action unfold. The noise was overwhelming, the clash of metal on metal, and the dull thud of fists and feet striking flesh. But what stood out most was the crowd's reaction. They weren't just watching, they were cheering, shouting encouragement or jeers at the fighters, their voices blending into a chaotic roar. Yeah. Get him. Don't let him get away. Finish him. The voices rang out from all sides, rising and falling like waves crashing against a shore. It was clear that this wasn't just a friendly sparring session. The fighters were out for blood, their movements fueled by something far more primal than simple training. Where is this? Renjiro axed, his thoughts a jumble of confusion and disbelief as he continued to take in his surroundings. This place was unlike anything he had ever seen in the Uchiha compound, or anywhere else, for that matter. Miwa turned to face him, a small, satisfied smile on her face as she saw the look on his face. This, she began, taking a few steps forward before turning back to him with a grin, is the battlegrounds. Renjiro blinked, the name taking a moment to sink in. The what now? Asterisk he asked. Does she mean a training ground? He wondered, though the atmosphere here felt far too intense for simple training. Miwa chuckled softly at his reaction, the battlegrounds, she repeated, is a place where most of the forces shinobi come to relax, train, earn some extra money, or even, in some cases, settle disputes. Her tone was casual as if she were describing a normal, everyday place, but there was a hint of pride in her voice. Renjiro frowned. How come I've never heard of it? I've been in the force for more than half a year now, he questioned, genuinely puzzled. He prided himself on being aware of everything that went on in the compound, and the timeline to some extent, but this was completely new to him. Miwa's smile turned smug, that's because it's invite only, she explained, crossing her arms over her chest. If you had friends who were members, then you would have heard about it. Fortunately for you, you have me. Renjiro's mind raced with questions as he looked around again, his gaze flicking over the fighters and the spectators. How do the clan elders even let this place be? He wondered, though the thought was quickly drowned out by the roar of the crowd as another fight reached its climax. He glanced over at the source of the noise, his eyes widening as he saw one of the fighters land a devastating blow that sent his opponent crashing to the ground. I know what you are thinking about, Miwa said as Renjiro focused on her. You are probably wondering why this is allowed by the clan leaders allow this right? Renjiro arched a brow, which was enough for Miwa to know that she was on point. It's simple, she began. They view this as an avenue where the clan members can come and relieve their stress. 
Really? Renjiro thought as he spared a glance to a shinobi who had just lost in the previous fight and his body was riddled with wounds. I am not sure that this can be considered as relieving stress. So, what do you think? Miwa asked, her voice cutting through the noise like a blade. Renjiro blinked, his mind momentarily blanking out as he tried to process everything. He finally found his voice, though it was laced with uncertainty. I think that it's good for getting more fighting experience, he said. Miwa's face lit up with approval. Exactly. That's why we're here. Renjiro frowned slightly. For training, he asked. Miwa shrugged, her expression turning slightly cryptic. Yeah, something like that. Before Renjiro could probe further, someone approached them. He noticed the figure, a man with sharp features and a confident stride, heading their way. Miwa turned to greet him, a familiar smile on her face. Re, good timing. This is my nephew, Renjiro. Re nodded in acknowledgement, his eyes briefly scanning Renjiro as if assessing him. Nice to meet you, Renjiro, he said in a polite tone, though his gaze was piercing. Renjiro gave a respectful bow. It's a pleasure to meet you as well, Risan. Ri then glanced at Miwa, his expression shifting to one of mild urgency. We're about to begin, he informed her, his tone indicating that this was something important. Miwa nodded, turning to Renjiro with a more serious expression. Come on, follow me, she instructed as she began to lead the way. It seems like this is more than just a visit, why wouldn't she just tell me why she brought me here? Renjiro thought as he started to become frustrated by the whole interaction. He followed closely behind, still unsure of what exactly was about to happen. They approached a space similar to the one Renjiro had seen earlier, a marked-off area where two shinobi were standing. The only difference was that they were not locked in combat, and there were no spectators present. The two were a young boy and a woman. They were both dressed in the standard black jumpsuits and green flak jackets. The boy was tall and broad-shouldered, with a calm, almost detached expression on his face. The woman, on the other hand, had a sharper, more intense look, her eyes glinting with anticipation as they approached. Is Miwa going to fight? Renjiro wondered, the thought both surprising and intriguing him. He had seen Miwa fight before, but not in a setting like this. The woman was the first to speak, Miwa, I thought you weren't going to show up, she said with a smirk playing on her lips. Miwa rolled her eyes but smiled back. Osaki, why would you even think that? You know I always keep my word, she retorted. Osaki's eyes twitched slightly at the remark, clearly recalling instances where Miwa hadn't exactly been punctual or reliable. Still, she let it slide, focusing instead on Renjiro. So, this is your nephew? Osaki asked, her gaze shifting to Renjiro, scrutinizing him from head to toe. Yes, he is, Miwa confirmed, glancing at Renjiro with a proud smile. Renjiro, this is Osaki and her nephew Keo. Renjiro took a step forward, bowing respectfully to both Osaki and Keo. It's an honor to meet you both, I am Uzumaki Renjiro, he said politely. Keo, who had been silent up until now, finally spoke, his voice low and calm. Likewise, he said, his expression unreadable as he studied Renjiro. Osaki's eyes flicked between Renjiro and Keo before she turned back to Miwa. So, when do we begin? she asked. Renjiro, who had been trying to piece together the situation, finally spoke up, Begin what? His eyes darted between Miwa and Osaki, hoping for some clarification. Osaki raised an eyebrow, a small smile playing on her lips as she glanced at Miwa. Your nephew doesn't seem to be aware of the situation, she remarked, her tone slightly amused. Miwa sighed, shaking her head slightly as if this was something she should have anticipated. Renjiro, you will be fighting Keo, she explained, her tone matter-of-fact. Renjiro's eyes widened slightly in surprise. Wait, what? he asked, his voice a mix of confusion and disbelief. 
He had assumed they were here for some kind of training, but he hadn't expected to be thrown into a fight, especially not one that seemed as serious as this. Miwa's expression softened slightly, though there was still a hint of challenge in her eyes. You'll be fighting on my behalf, she said, her voice calm but firm. Renjiro stared at her thinking, is that supposed to make me feel better? But why do I have to fight at all? Renjiro asked again. It seemed like Miwa was avoiding his question, so he kept asking it, trying to get to the root of all of this. Miwa paused, her expression thoughtful before she sighed lightly. All right, Renjiro, I guess I owe you an explanation, she began. Osaki and I, well, we have a bit of a dispute, and we decided to settle it through a fight. Renjiro blinked. A dispute, he echoed. What does that have to do with me? Miwa smiled. Well, we decided that instead of fighting ourselves, we'd have our nephews fight on our behalf, she explained, her tone as if this was a perfectly logical solution. How does this concern me? Renjiro thought, the absurdity of the situation starting to settle in. But Miwa, I just came back from a mission, he protested, his voice edged with fatigue. I'm not in the condition to give it my all in a fight. Miwa, however, wasn't about to let him off the hook that easily. She grinned. You were planning on training before resting, weren't you? She countered. So I'm sure you'll be fine. Renjiro stared at her. Training is different from fighting, he pointed out. Miwa chuckled. It's all the same, she said, waving her hand dismissively as if brushing off his concerns. You've been through tougher fights than this, Renjiro. Besides, it's not like you're going into battle. You're just sparring with Ko. It's good practice. Renjiro's mind raced as he tried to think of another way out of this, but Miwa's relaxed attitude and confident smile made it clear that she wasn't going to back down. He felt a mix of frustration and resignation settling over him, knowing that arguing further would likely be pointless. With a heavy sigh, Renjiro finally relented. All right, fine, he said, his tone carrying a hint of resignation. I'll do it. But what are the rules? Osaki, who had been watching the exchange with a slightly amused expression, stepped forward, her voice calm but firm. No killing, she said simply, her gaze steady as she looked between Renjiro and Keo. That's the only rule. This is a spar, not a fight to the deathmatch. Yeah, right? As if spar isn't just a word to sugarcoat it. Renjiro thought. He had seen the venue, if this was some sort of sparring, doing it in one of the training grounds near the base would be the logical thing to do. But they were in a place called Battleground. Safety was not something one would think of when they heard of the place, let alone see it. He glanced at Miwa, who was watching him with an expectant expression. Miwa smiled, a hint of pride in her eyes. Show them what you're capable of. Keo, who had remained silent throughout the discussion, stepped forward, his expression calm but focused. I look forward to our match, he said, his voice low and measured. Renjiro nodded in acknowledgement, studying Keo's demeanor. There was no malice or hostility in his tone, just a sense of purpose and determination. It was clear that Keo was taking this fight seriously, and Renjiro knew that he would have to do the same. They stepped into the designated fighting area and took their positions. Renjiro took a deep breath, centering himself as he shifted into a ready stance. Across from him, Ko did the same, his movements precise and controlled. There was a calmness to him, a sense of composure that spoke of experience and confidence. For a brief moment, the world seemed to hold its breath as they stood there, poised to strike. Then, with a sudden burst of movement, Ko attacked. Kaya moved with a fluidity and precision that spoke of years of rigorous training. His fists flew in a series of rapid jabs, each one aimed with deadly accuracy. Renjiro barely had time to react, his arms coming up instinctively to block the onslaught. Even so, the force behind Kaya's strikes was undeniable. With each impact, Renjiro felt the sting in his hands and arms, the power behind the blows seeping into his bones. He's strong, Renjiro muttered under his breath, 
shaking his hand as the sting from one particularly hard strike radiated up his arm. The pain was sharp, but pain was not something that Renjiro was new to. Renjiro decided to counter with a swift kick aimed at Kaya's midsection, hoping to break his rhythm. Kaya, however, was ready. He twisted his body just enough to avoid the full brunt of the attack, then retaliated with a low sweep aimed at Renjiro's legs. Renjiro leapt back, narrowly avoiding being taken off his feet, and the two combatants circled each other warily. The fight was drawing attention. A crowd began to gather, the onlookers curious about the unexpected duel. Most of them knew Kaya. He was a regular at the battlegrounds, a fighter whose skill in taijutsu was well known among the shinobi who frequented the area. Renjiro, on the other hand, was a fresh face, and the spectators were eager to see how he would fare against someone as seasoned as Kaya. Seeing the growing crowd, Miwa's eyes lit up. She turned to Osaki with a grin, her voice carrying over the rising murmur of the audience. Looks like we've got ourselves a good match here. What do you say we make this interesting? Osaki raised an eyebrow, a small smile playing on her lips. What do you have in mind? She asked, her tone laced with curiosity. Bets, Miwa replied with a mischievous glint in her eye. Let's see who's willing to put their money on the line. Osaki chuckled, nodding in agreement. All right, let's do it. But don't be too disappointed when you lose. The crowd, overhearing their conversation, quickly got in on the action. Bets were placed with most of them favored Kaya. Meanwhile, Renjiro and Kaya remained focused, unaware of the wagers being made on their behalf. After a series of exchanges, both fighters leapt back simultaneously, creating a distance between them. Renjiro took a moment to catch his breath, his mind racing as he tried to assess the situation. He was probing me, he thought. Renjiro realized that Kaya's attacks, though intense, had been calculated, meant to gauge Renjiro's strengths and weaknesses. Across from him, Kaya was thinking along similar lines. He's good, he mused, feeling a spark of excitement that he hadn't felt in a while. I'm going to enjoy this. Kaya wasn't just any opponent. At 14, he was already a Chunin, a rank he had held for a couple of years. He should have been promoted to Jounin by now, but there was one thing that held him back, his minimal chakra reserves. Most of it going into his dojitsu. It was a limitation that had frustrated him for years, preventing him from mastering the more advanced jutsu required for higher ranks. But instead of letting it hinder him, Kaya had adapted. He had poured his energy into honing his taijutsu, turning his body into a weapon that needed no chakra to be deadly. His skills in genjutsu were basic, and his ninjutsu was almost non-existent, but when it came to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, Kaya was a force to be reckoned with. Coupled with his Sharingan, he was more powerful than regular chunins. You're better than I expected, Kaya remarked, his breathing slightly heavier but his eyes still sharp as they locked onto Renjiro. Renjiro, equally winded but maintaining his composure, replied with a nod. Thanks, he said, his voice steady despite the strain of the fight. You're not so bad yourself. A slight grin tugged at the corners of Kaya's mouth, a spark of mutual respect flashing in his eyes. Let's see how long you can keep up, he said, his tone carrying a hint of challenge. Renjiro didn't respond, but his resolve hardened. He could tell that Kaya was far from done, and neither was he. He couldn't rely on ninjutsu alone against someone like Kaya. This fight was going to be won with raw skill and determination. Kaya closed his eyes for a moment, his breathing slowing as he focused inward. Renjiro watched him, confusion knitting his brow. What is he doing? Renjiro wondered, his eyes narrowing as he tried to discern the purpose of Kaya's actions. He knew that he was preparing something and wanted to stop him since giving time to your opponent never ended well for anyone unless you had overwhelming strength. But Renjiro did not stop Kaya. Not because he had overwhelming strength, but because of curiosity. From their first exchange, he could tell that Kaya was talented. 
So for him to do this meant that he had something in store for Renjiro. Renjiro could not wait to see what that was. Renjiro knew that this may cost him later, but he did not care. The thrill of the battle that he was experiencing now was intoxicating. When Kaya opened his eyes again, he was the same as before, or so it seemed. Renjiro frowned, unable to detect any immediate difference in Kaya's demeanor or fighting style. He was slightly disappointed. There's no difference, he thought, still puzzled. I wonder what he was doing by closing his eyes? No, wait, he's way calmer than before. From the sidelines, Osaki observed the fight with a knowing smirk. It seems Kaya has already gotten into it, she thought, recognizing the change in her nephew's aura. Kaya moved first, his body a blur as he launched himself at Renjiro. His speed was as impressive as before, but there was a new level of control to his movements, a fluidity that made him even more dangerous. Renjiro met him head-on, their fists and feet colliding in a flurry of strikes and counters. Each impact sent shockwaves through their bodies, the force of their blows reverberating in the air. As they clashed, Renjiro couldn't help but feel that something had shifted in the fight. Kaya's attacks were sharper and more precise, and Renjiro found himself on the defensive, struggling to keep up with the relentless assault. Suddenly, Kaya delivered an upward kick that caught Renjiro off guard. The force of the blow sent Renjiro hurtling into the air, his body twisting as he tried to regain control. But Kaya was already in motion, leaping after him with astonishing speed. Renjiro barely had time to react before Kaya's arms locked around him in a tight hold, preventing him from escaping or counterattacking. Panic flared in Renjiro's mind as he realized what was happening. Wait, is this he? His thought was cut off as they reached the peak of the initial kick's arc. In an instant, Kaya began spinning, using the momentum of their ascent to propel them headfirst toward the ground. The world became a dizzying blur as they spiraled downward, the ground rushing up to meet them with terrifying speed. At the last possible moment, Kaya released Renjiro and retreated to safety, leaving Renjiro to collide with the ground alone. Boom! The impact was thunderous, a resounding crash that echoed through the battlegrounds. The crowd erupted in cheers, their excitement reaching a fever pitch as they witnessed Kaya's signature but devastating move. Osaki turned to Miwa, her tone mocking as she called out, Looks like your nephew's in trouble, Miwa. Should we start wrapping this up? Miwa, though concerned, kept her composure. Don't count him out just yet, she replied, her voice steady even as she clenched her fists. She believed in Renjiro, she had to. Renjiro groaned as he pushed himself up from the ground, his vision swimming as he tried to regain his bearings. His body ached all over, his bones feeling as if they had been rattled to the core. Was that what I thought it was? he wondered, wincing as he shifted his weight. Did he just open the first gate of opening? The pain in Renjiro's shoulder was intense, but he gritted his teeth and popped it back into place with a sharp jerk. Pop! Renjiro had managed to move his head just in time, hitting the ground with his right shoulder. His chest throbbed where the impact had bruised his ribs, but even as he felt the pain, he also felt something else, a warmth spreading through his body as his enhanced regeneration kicked in, mending the damage faster than any normal person could. He was grateful for it now more than ever. Without it, Kaya's move might have ended the fight then and there. He knows the eight gates, I just hope he is not experienced with the technique. If he has mastered more than the five gates, then this might go from hard to dangerous. Renjiro thought. Kaya stood a short distance away, panting slightly but wearing a smirk of satisfaction. He knew the effectiveness of his attack, and he had expected it to do significant damage. But when Renjiro stood up, still ready to fight, Kaya's smirk deepened. You're tougher than you look, he said, respect evident in his tone. Renjiro's eyes narrowed as he assessed his opponent. Kaya's smirk was confident, but there was no arrogance in it, just the acknowledgement of a worthy adversary. Renjiro couldn't afford to underestimate him. I can't win this with just Taijutsu, Renjiro realized, but that's not what this fight is about. 
This was just a spar, so Renjiro was having a hard time between staying his hand or going all out. Doing the former would be better, but that would be an anticlimactic end to a spar that Renjiro enjoyed. So he decided to go with the latter option and continue with the spar. Now he had to choose how he was going to approach it, because there were things he could not reveal yet, especially with a countless pair of eyes on the two chunins. I can't use my chains, so that's off the table. Renjiro thought. This ability of his was already known but by a limited number of people in the village who were either close to him or his superiors. And Renjiro was not planning on increasing that number of people any time soon. Even without it, I can still manage to win this. With renewed determination, Renjiro lunged at Kaya, and the battle resumed. The two fighters moved with a speed and intensity that made it difficult for the spectators to keep up. Each strike was a calculated effort to find an opening, each counter a testament to their skill and experience. As they exchanged blows, Kaya could feel the strain of the fight starting to take its toll. The frontal lotus had already taken a lot from him but his opponent was no pushover as he could still go on. His breathing grew heavier, his muscles aching from the continuous exertion. But he was far from done. He had trained for years to push his body to its limits and beyond, and he wasn't about to let up now. Finally, Kaya made his move. He took a deep breath and focused, summoning the strength from deep within his body. His chakra reserves were limited, but they were just enough for what he needed to do. He pushed past another barrier that held his power in check, feeling the surge of energy as he opened the second gate, the gate of healing. Renjiro saw the change immediately. Kaya's eyes blazed with intensity, his movements becoming almost too fast to follow. He launched himself at Renjiro with renewed ferocity, his strikes hitting with even greater force than before. Each punch and kick was a blur of motion, and Renjiro found himself barely able to keep up. He's opened the second gate, Renjiro realized with a mix of awe and dread. The increased speed and power were overwhelming, and Renjiro knew he was in serious trouble. The crowd watched in awe as the fight reached its climax. The intensity of the battle was unlike anything they had seen before from such young shinobi. The spectators were riveted by the display of skill and determination on both sides. Kaya's eyes narrowed as he sized up Renjiro. Despite the exhaustion creeping into his limbs, his mind remained sharp, calculating his next move. You're a strong one, Kaya remarked. But even as he spoke, he had something else in mind. Without warning, Kaya lunged at Renjiro, closing the distance between them in an instant. He launched a few more blows towards Renjiro and as the latter blocked them, Kaya grabbed Renjiro's wrist with a grip that was both firm and deliberate, manipulating his opponent's fingers into the precise hand signs needed for a jutsu. Renjiro's eyes widened in surprise, realizing too late what Kaya was doing. Katan, Gukaku no jutsu! Kaya shouted, channeling his chakra. In rapid succession, four massive fireballs erupted from Kaya's mouth, roaring toward Renjiro with blistering speed. Each fireball was a blazing inferno, the heat from them searing the air around them. Renjiro reacted quickly, his body moving on instinct as he dodged the first fireball by rolling to the side. The second one followed closely behind, forcing him to leap backwards to avoid being engulfed in flames. The third and fourth fireballs came in quick succession, but Renjiro was already on the move, using his agility and quick reflexes to stay just ahead of the fiery barrage. The flames roared past him, exploding into the ground where he had stood just moments before. The impact sent shockwaves through the earth, sending dirt and debris flying in all directions. Renjiro landed in a crouch, his mind racing as he formulated a plan to counter Kaya's relentless assault. He slammed his hands onto the ground, channeling his chakra into the earth beneath him. Dotan, Doryu Hiki. Renjiro called out. In response, a series of massive earth walls erupted from the ground, forming a protective barrier between him and Kaya. The walls were thick and sturdy, each one reinforced with Renjiro's chakra to withstand the destructive force of the fireballs. Kaya, undeterred, 
continued to launch fireball after fireball at Renjiro. The first few collided with the Earth's walls, smashing into them with a thunderous roar and sending cracks spider webbing across their surfaces. The heat from the flames caused the Earth to glow red hot, but Renjiro's chakra-infused walls held strong, absorbing most of the impact. But Kaya's fireballs were relentless, and as they continued to strike the walls, they began to wear them down. One by one, the earth walls crumbled under the pressure, chunks of rock and soil being blasted away by the sheer force of the attacks. However, Renjiro had created numerous walls, each one designed to buy him just enough time to execute his next move. As the final earth wall was reduced to rubble, Kaya saw his opportunity. He prepared to move in, aiming to catch Renjiro off guard. But just as he was about to make his move, Renjiro emerged from the ground directly behind him, his hands crackling with lightning. Chidori! Renjiro called out. The sight of the Chidori caused the crowd to gasp in surprise. It was the first time they were seeing a jutsu like this. The air around Renjiro hummed with the intensity of the lightning, the sound of it sharp and crackling like a thousand birds chirping at once. But Renjiro knew the dangers of using such a technique in a spar, especially against an opponent like Kaya. He had toned down the intensity of the Chidori, focusing its power into his hands rather than letting it run wild. And instead of aiming for Kaya's vital organs, Renjiro directed the attack at Kaya's hand, a place where, if injured, Kaya could get it healed without any lasting damage. Kaya's Sharingan flashed, and in that split second, he saw the attack coming. His body moved on instinct, twisting just enough to avoid the full brunt of the Chidori. Renjiro's hand grazed Kaya's wrist, the lightning chakra searing the skin but not causing any serious harm. Kaya leapt backwards, putting distance between himself and Renjiro, his heart pounding in his chest from the close call. That was close, Kaya muttered to himself, his eyes narrowing as he prepared for the next exchange. The fight continued, each strike more desperate and precise than the last. Renjiro's stamina was impressive, his movements still sharp and controlled despite the grueling battle. Kaya, on the other hand, was beginning to feel the effects of his opened gates. His chakra reserves were nearly depleted, and his muscles burned with fatigue, but he pushed on, refusing to back down. The crowd roared with excitement as the two combatants traded blows, their admiration for the skill and determination of the fighters growing with each passing moment. Every punch, kick and jutsu was met with cheers and gasps, the spectators on the edge of their seats as they watched the intense battle unfold. But it was becoming clear that Kaya was reaching his limit. Finally, in the middle of one of their exchanges, Kaya's legs buckled beneath him. He stumbled, his vision blurring as exhaustion took hold. Renjiro, seeing the opening, moved to strike, but stopped himself just in time as he realized what was happening. Kaya collapsed to the ground, gasping for breath as his body refused to continue. He looked up at Renjiro, who stood over him, breathing heavily but still ready to fight. Kaya knew he had nothing left to give, his chakra was nearly gone, and his body was on the verge of collapse. With a sigh of resignation, Kaya raised his hand in surrender. I concede, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Renjiro lowered his fists, relief flooding through him as the tension of the fight finally began to ebb away. He couldn't help but reflect on the fight. It seems that he hasn't fully mastered the technique, Renjiro thought to himself, relieved that the battle hadn't escalated to an even more dangerous level. Because if he did, I would have been facing a Sharingan on steroids. Renjiro extended a hand to Kaya, pulling him up from the ground. Despite the fatigue weighing down his muscles, Kaya offered a genuine smile. You fought well, Renjiro said, respect evident in his tone. So did you, Kaya replied. But at some point, I realized I couldn't keep up with you forever. Your stamina is something else. His voice carried a note of resignation, but also admiration. Around them, the crowd erupted into cheers and applause. The spectators, who had been enthralled by the intense battle, were now buzzing with excitement as they discussed the match. Bets were quickly settled, 
with some grumbling and others cheering in victory. The fight had been a display of skill, endurance, and sheer willpower, qualities that both Renjiro and Kaya had in abundance. That technique you were using, it's unique, Renjiro said. He wanted to know how the Chunin came across it. Kaya chuckled softly. It's the thing that ignited my hope of becoming a shinobi, he said. Renjiro raised an eyebrow. This was not what he was expecting. What do you mean? He asked, his curiosity peaked. Kaya sighed. For the longest time, my chakra reserves haven't been enough, Kaya began. It's even a miracle that I awakened my dojitsu. However, that meant that I fell behind in ninjutsu training because most of my chakra went to maintaining my eyes. It was disheartening, knowing that I couldn't match my peers in ninjutsu no matter how hard I tried. Ooh, so he is just like Guy, at least to some extent. Renjiro listened intently, understanding the struggle of feeling inadequate, especially in a world where chakra was everything. Kaya continued, that's why I was so glad when I stumbled upon the Eight Gates technique. I found it in the clan's private library. The Eight Gates. It makes sense that the Uchiha clan could have copied it. But I thought that only Guy and his dad stuck to the technique. Even after Duwei used it to destroy the Mist Swordsman, no one seemed to take it seriously. Renjiro thought, his mind racing as he considered the implications of Kaya's words. I'm sure if you were able to open the other gates, the fight would have ended differently, Renjiro remarked. He knew the potential power of the eight gates, and he knew that if Kaya mastered it, he would be a formidable opponent. Just thinking of an Uchiha mastering caused shivers to run down his spine. Kaya's eyes widened in surprise. You know about the technique? He asked, clearly taken aback. The eight gates were not widely known, even those who knew about it never failed to recognize its potential. Renjiro nodded, a thoughtful expression on his face. I've heard about it from the Eternal Genin, Mike Duwei. He's one of the few who fully embraced the technique. You guys are actually the same. Kaya's surprise deepened. There's another person in the village practicing the same technique? He asked, astonishment clear in his voice. Renjiro couldn't help but smile at Kaya's reaction. Makes sense, he thought. As far as I know, Duwei should still be alive now, so the village is still underestimating him. But anyone who knows the truth would never make that mistake. You should get in touch with him, Renjiro suggested, his tone serious. He might be able to help you with the technique, especially if you've reached a point where you can't open the other gates. Kaya considered Renjiro's words, a thoughtful expression crossing his face. You're right, he finally said, nodding. I've been stuck for a while now, unable to push past the limitations of the first few gates. Maybe he could help me take it further. Just as the conversation seemed to be winding down, a thought occurred to Renjiro. Wait, he began, a note of confusion creeping into his voice. How did you access the private library if you're not a squad leader? Kaya looked at Renjiro, his expression one of mild surprise. What do you mean? The private library is free for all clan members as long as you have the required contribution points. Renjiro's confusion deepened. What? He said, more to himself than to Kaya. Did Fujioka play me? I thought it was open only to squad leaders and above. The realization hit him like a ton of bricks, and he couldn't help but feel a bit cheated. Before Renjiro could dwell too long on the implications of this new information, Osaki and Miwa approached them, their expressions a mixture of approval and pride. You two did well, Osaki said, her voice carrying a note of reluctant admiration as she addressed Kaya. You fought with everything you had, Kaya, and that's all I could ask for. Miwa, never one to miss an opportunity, grinned broadly as she extended her hand to Osaki. And don't forget, you owe me, Miwa said. Osaki sighed, clearly not thrilled about losing the bet but too honorable to renege it. With a slight grimace, she handed over a small pouch of coins to Miwa, who accepted it with a triumphant smile. A deal's a deal, Osaki muttered, though there was a hint of amusement in her voice despite her loss. 
Ah, she's getting paid? I need to sort out my meals for the next few weeks. Renjiro suddenly smirked as an idea formed in his mind. Since you're in such a good mood, Miwa, he began, his voice teasing. How about treating us all to a meal? After all, I did just win you that bet. What? Miwa's I couldn't help but twitch. You're really going to take advantage of this, aren't you? She said, but there was no real annoyance in her tone. Taking advantage? Between me and her, who is taking advantage of the other? Renjiro thought. Of course, Renjiro replied with a grin. We fought hard, and I think we deserve a little reward. Besides, you can afford it now, right? Osaki chuckled, clearly enjoying the banter. I think that's a fair request, Miwa. After all, it's not every day you get to watch a fight like that and come out richer for it. Miwa rolled her eyes, fine, fine, she relented. But don't expect anything too fancy. I'm not made of money, you know. You just got paid for winning a bet. Renjiro thought. Frankly, he was appalled and a bit impressed by Miwa's shamelessness. As the group began to make their way out of the training grounds, the atmosphere was one of camaraderie and mutual respect. The tension of the fight had faded, replaced by the easy banter that comes with shared experiences and hard-earned victories. The sun had fully set by the time Renjiro and Tucci left Tucci's. As they reached the point where they would each go their separate ways, Renjiro turned to Kaya, he said, You've got a lot of potential, Kaya. Don't let anything hold you back. Renjiro had found some respect for Kaya, especially when he found out that he purely relied on Taijutsu. It even impressed him and he wanted to nudge him on the right path where Kaya would achieve all his dreams. Renjiro was aware of how hard being a shinobi was, the blood and sweat required to constantly improve yourself. While his path ever since he transmigrated had not been easy, Renjiro couldn't imagine how harder it would have been if he were in Kaya's shoes. Plus he also wanted to see how far Kaya would go if he mastered the eight gates. Kaya nodded, a determined look in his eyes. I won't, he promised, and I'll definitely reach out to Mike Duwei. Thanks for the advice, Renjiro. Renjiro smiled, clapping Kaya on the shoulder. Anytime, he said. We're all in this together, after all. With that, they parted ways, each heading back to their respective homes. When Renjiro got back home, he couldn't help but the fight he had earlier that day. I was kinda lucky that Kaya didn't open more gates, Renjiro muttered to himself. The fact that his victory had come not from overpowering Kaya but from simply outlasting him left a bitter taste in his mouth. I won because Kaya wore himself out, yes, that is a boon in my fighting capabilities but I can't keep relying on it as it is not sustainable, Renjiro thought, his brow furrowing in irritation. It feels like I've been winning many of my battles through technicalities. He clenched his jaw, the bitterness festering. While he knew he had been holding back for obvious reasons, it was just a spar, after all, Renjiro couldn't shake the feeling that he was making excuses for himself. Sure, I didn't go all out, he admitted inwardly, but deep down, I want more than just a victory handed to me by circumstance. I want to dominate the spar. Renjiro's desire to dominate wasn't born out of cruelty or arrogance but from an insatiable need for excellence. He didn't just want to be good at what he did. He had to be the best, to stand at the pinnacle in both strategy and raw combat power for what was to come. And yet, here he was, feeling like his wins were hollow because they lacked the decisive power he craved. There's no point in having cards up my sleeve if I can't use them when I want, Renjiro muttered under his breath. Or better yet, use them efficiently. He sighed, the frustration simmering just below the surface. I need a technique I can rely on, something I can use even with all the eyes constantly watching me in this village. Renjiro stood, pacing the room as he thought. His mind returned to Kaya's use of the eight gates. The technique was perfect for what Renjiro needed. Power, explosiveness, and the ability to dominate any opponent, regardless of chakra or jutsu limitations. The eight gates, Renjiro murmured to himself, that's what I need. 
That's the perfect technique for me right now. As the idea solidified in his mind, Renjiro began to map out the path ahead of him. But how am I supposed to go about it? He wondered. Kaya had learned the technique on his own, but was that the best approach for Renjiro? I could try contacting Might Du Wei and befriend him, Renjiro mused out loud. Or I could try teaching myself the technique. Kaya managed it, so how hard could it be? The thought lingered for a moment before Renjiro nodded to himself. Yes, that might work, he said with conviction. If I can open the first gate on my own, then I can reach out to Might Du Wei for advice and guidance. Feeling more resolved than he had in days, Renjiro began planning his next steps. But that said, I need to check out the private library. I'm sure there are other techniques that would be suitable for me in addition to the eight gates. With his mind clear and his path forward mapped out, Renjiro felt a sense of calm wash over him. He returned to his seals, working diligently for the next couple of hours. After that, he rested. He had just returned from a mission and knew that pushing himself too hard would only lead to diminishing returns. The next morning, Renjiro rose with the dawn, feeling refreshed and ready for the day. His squad was still on break, giving him time to focus on his own training. Once he finished his training, Renjiro made his way to the Uchiha clan's private library, eager to explore the possibilities that awaited him within its hidden depths. The private library was tucked away beneath the clan's meeting hall, close to where Daichi's office also resided. It was an unassuming entrance, concealed within the winding corridors of the clan's headquarters. There were no grand signs or ornate decorations marking the library, just a simple, reinforced wooden door with a modest seal embedded in its center. I am sure that Hiruzen knows about this, even if they try to keep it private. Renjiro mused. Renjiro knew that there were few things that one could hide under the Hokage's nose. Especially when he kept spying on people with his crystal ball, so this was something he was sure Hiruzen knew of. Most clans probably have such facilities and are afforded privacy on such matters. But the way that the village council had been ganging up against the clan, I am not sure if this will keep on being private. Renjiro thought as he entered the room. Ahead of him, an older man stood silently near the library's entrance. His posture was rigid yet calm, hands clasped behind his back as he observed his surroundings with an air of quiet authority. His hair was streaked with gray, and his traditional Uchiha robes were immaculate, marked with the clan's red and white fan symbol. Renjiro immediately recognized him as one of the elders of the clan. He hesitated for a moment, trying to recall the elder's name. Was his name Toshiaki? Yes, I think that's it. Toshiaki, Renjiro thought, his brow furrowing slightly. Though he knew the man by reputation, Renjiro had rarely interacted with him. Elders like Toshiaki often kept to themselves, overseeing the clan's affairs from the shadows while the younger generation took care of more direct duties. Taking a deep breath, Renjiro approached the elder. I should be respectful, he reminded himself. As Renjiro neared him, he gave a slight bow. Good morning, Toshiaki-sama, he greeted, straightening up once again. Toshiaki's eyes shifted to Renjiro, and though his mouth curled into a polite smile, Renjiro noticed something unsettling. He's smiling with his mouth, but his eyes, they haven't changed, Renjiro thought. The elder's smile didn't quite reach his eyes. His gaze remained cold, sharp, and calculating, a contrast to the friendly expression he tried to convey. Ah, young Renjiro, Toshiaki said, his voice smooth and measured. It is good to see our youth taking interest in the library. Are you here to study some new jutsu, perhaps? Renjiro nodded, keeping his voice even. Yes, Toshiaki-sama. I was hoping to broaden my knowledge and improve my skills, he replied. Hmm, I see. Always good to sharpen one's skills. We can't afford complacency, even within our own clan. Without missing a beat, Toshiaki gestured to a flat metal plate embedded in a pedestal beside him. It was a strange object, marked with intricate seals. Before you proceed, 
Toshiaki said, his voice now carrying a slightly formal tone. I will need you to place your hands on this plate and activate your Sharingan. Renjiro's brow furrowed slightly as he looked down at the plate. He noted the seals immediately, though he could not recognize any of them which was interesting. But he didn't hesitate. He placed his hands on the cold metal surface. Toshiaki watched him closely, his sharp eyes never leaving Renjiro's face. Toshiaki began, what is your name and rank within the clan? Renjiro blinked in surprise but quickly composed himself. My name is Uzumaki Renjiro, he answered smoothly. I'm currently ranked as a chunin and a squad leader. Toshiaki's gaze remained steady as Renjiro spoke. When the younger Uchiha finished, Toshiaki gave a slight nod, seemingly satisfied. I see. Then everything is fine, Renjiro raised an eyebrow at that, though he quickly lowered it, masking his curiosity. He didn't want to appear too inquisitive in front of Toshiaki, but the mention of contributions intrigued him. Before he could ask, Toshiaki continued speaking. You have earned enough contribution points to access the first floor of the library, Toshiaki explained, stepping back and gesturing toward the deeper sections of the library. Renjiro glanced at the elder with a puzzled expression. Toshiaki-sama, if I could ask, what was the point of the questioning? The elder Uchiha regarded Renjiro with a moment of silence, his cold eyes locking onto Renjiro's curious expression. Toshiaki's voice, when it came, was measured and deliberate, as though he were considering each word before releasing it into the air. It is a necessary procedure to ensure that no one outside of the Uchiha clan infiltrates this space. We also use it to verify your identity and confirm that you are not under any form of Genjutsu. Our enemies, even within Konoha, may seek to exploit the knowledge held here. He said, inclining his head slightly. Toshiaki's words carried a certain gravity, reminding Renjiro of the delicate balance of trust and secrecy that the Uchiha maintained with the rest of the village. Damn, Tobarama really did a number of them. Renjiro mused. The second shinobi had isolated the clan. Whether it was intentional or not was up for debate, but that action had a domino effect that caused the clan to be more withdrawn from the rest of the village. We must ensure, Toshiaki continued, that what is contained within this library never leaves the confines of the clan unless under the strictest of conditions. There are many who would do anything for the power stored here. True, the forbidden jutsus like the Izanagi is dangerous, but it can only work if they already have a Sharingan. The Chunin thought. Renjiro nodded, understanding the elder's cautious nature. He felt a chill run down his spine, realizing how much the clan guarded its knowledge. The procedures were not just for show, there was real danger in the misuse of the techniques stored in this hidden library. I understand, Toshiaki-sama, Renjiro began again. I have also heard you mention something about contribution points before, could you explain exactly what they entail? I've been so caught up in my work at the police force that I never really got around to learning about them. He doesn't know about them? The elder wondered as his eyes widened slightly, and he let out a long, exasperated sigh. You're not the first to let their duties overwhelm them, I suppose, he said, though there was a hint of impatience in his voice. But really, you should know this by now, Renjiro. Contribution points are what grant you access to the deeper secrets of the Uchiha clan. They are awarded for your service, your achievements, and your dedication to advancing the interests of the clan. The elder's gaze sharpened as he continued, clearly wanting to impress the importance of this system upon Renjiro. Everything you do, whether it be missions, advancing your skills, or bringing honor to the clan, is rewarded with these points. The more points you accrue, the more access you are granted, to our resources, our techniques, and our knowledge. In this way, we ensure that only the most loyal and valuable members of the clan are entrusted with our deepest secrets. Renjiro nodded slowly, processing this information. I see, he replied. So it's not just about rank or skill. It's about proving your worth through your actions. Toshiaki smiled faintly, though once again it didn't reach his eyes. 
Precisely, he said. Remember, Renjiro, you are always being watched, by your peers, by the clan elders, and even by the Hokage. What you do matters, not just for yourself, but for the legacy of the Uchiha. Well, that was not subtle at all. Renjiro thought as he recognized the cautioning undertone in what Toshiaki had said. Renjiro did ask how many contribution points he had and Toshiaki informed him that he had around 17,000 contribution points in total. He would need another 13,000 to access the second lower floor of the private library. With that weighty conversation behind him, Renjiro bowed once again to Toshiaki and ventured deeper into the library. I wonder if I can use my seals to get more contribution points, Renjiro wondered. The room was lit by soft glowing orbs of chakra-infused lights that hovered near the ceiling, casting a gentle glow over the shelves. The air grew cooler as he moved further in, and the dim lighting gave the whole place a somber, almost sacred feel. The shelves were filled with scrolls, each one meticulously categorized and stored. The entire structure seemed designed to be as unassuming as possible. There were no lavish decorations or elaborate displays, only bare stone walls and rows upon rows of scrolls. As Renjiro reached for one of the jutsus, his fingers brushing against the delicate parchment, something curious happened. The text contained in the scroll seemed garbled at first, foreign symbols he couldn't make sense of. But when his Sharingan focused in on the writing, the characters began to shift, rearranging themselves into a language he could understand. Is this the same language as the one on the shrine? Renjiro wondered, narrowing his eyes as the characters resolved themselves. If it is, then the Uchiha are really thorough about this. Renjiro was right on the mark. The text on the scrolls was written in a language derived from the partially deciphered stone tablet in the Uchiha shrine. Only those with a Sharingan, and a powerful one at that, could read the text fully. It was a clever method of ensuring that only the most capable Uchiha could access the knowledge stored here. So even if you somehow managed to get the required contributional points, you still had to be capable of actually deciphering the text. Renjiro smiled faintly to himself. It's as much a test of skill as it is a safeguard. As Renjiro read further, he deciphered the contents of the scroll. The technique it described was one he had heard of and seen before, though not in great detail. It was the Kage Main no Jutsu, also known as the Shadow Imitation Technique, a famous Jutsu from the Nara clan. So they've copied techniques from other clans as well, he thought. I wonder why I haven't seen anyone use this Jutsu. The answer came to him quickly, and he let out a small chuckle. Of course, the Uchiha are far too proud to openly use techniques from other clans. From his interaction with most members of the clan, Renjiro concluded that they prided themselves on their own power and their own abilities. Adopting Jutsus from another clan would be seen as a weakness, an admission that their techniques weren't superior. He continued reading, intrigued by the precision and intelligence behind the Nara clan's Jutsu. The text described the requirements for using the technique, the focus, the control over one's shadow, and the significant amount of chakra needed to maintain it over a long period. Of course, it was cheaper for Nara clan members. But it also mentioned that the Uchiha had copied these techniques primarily for defensive purposes, to counter them in battle. Renjiro could see why. The scroll detailed ways in which the Uchiha had studied and deconstructed these techniques, learning their weaknesses and vulnerabilities. For the Aburame clan's Jutsu, for example, the Uchiha had noted the necessity of implanting bugs into the user's body, making them easy to identify and counter. The Akimichi clan's techniques, which relied on the precise use of calories, could be countered by targeting their chakra reserves or stamina. Renjiro smirked as he closed the scroll thinking, well, Kakashi copied a lot of Jutsu, so maybe I can find something useful here as well. As he perused more scrolls, Renjiro came across several other interesting techniques. One caught his eye in particular, the Body Pathway Derangement, a high-level medical ninjutsu technique used by Tsunade. According to the scroll, it allowed the user to disrupt the target's nervous system by sending chakra into their body via physical touch, 
causing their movements to misfire and leaving them vulnerable in battle. Renjiro was impressed. It's a fascinating technique, he thought. But it requires more specialized knowledge of medical ninjutsu than I currently have. Getting the knowledge is not a problem. The issue is that I would have to spend a considerable amount of time to acquire said knowledge besides, it's not really my style. He moved on, coming across more and more jutsu, each with its own unique requirements and complexities. The Super Beast Imitating Drawing, a technique used later by Sai, was another that caught his eye, though Renjiro quickly dismissed it. It would take too much time to master, and it required a level of artistic skill that he simply didn't possess. He preferred traditional fuenjutsu which did not require such artistic skill. Other techniques, such as those from the Aburame clan, required special insects to be implanted in the user's body. Again, something Renjiro could not replicate. Finally, after what felt like hours of searching, Renjiro found the scroll he had been looking for. His breath caught in his throat as his fingers brushed against the old parchment. The title at the top of the scroll was unmistakable, The Eight Gates Technique. Renjiro's eyes scanned over the ancient scroll, his Sharingan spinning lazily as he absorbed every word of the text. They really copied it, he muttered, barely above a whisper, as the symbols shifted and realigned themselves into a readable script. Yet as his eyes flicked through the detailed descriptions of the technique, Renjiro's brow furrowed. He paused. What? It only goes up to the third gate. His mind raced with questions. Then why the hell is it in the private library if it's incomplete? It should have been in the public library. Renjiro could not understand it. He was aware of the potential of the technique but all that depended on it being complete. Even if he mastered all the first three gates, then his power output would only take him to the elite Jounin rank at best. He could already feel the bitterness rise in his throat at the thought. And that's me being generous, he thought with a grimace. Renjiro's hand tightened on the scroll as he considered the possibilities. They must have placed this scroll here because they recognized the potential of the technique. The clan wouldn't waste space in this library on something they didn't value. But why would they put it here if it's incomplete? Even Madara immediately recognized the technique when Guy used it. That means there must have been other users of the technique before Guy and his father. So, surely, the clan had other sources to copy the technique from. Duwei can likely open more than five gates, right? Renjiro shook his head feeling a mix of exasperation and determination. Maybe I'm overthinking this, he concluded after a few moments of thought. It's possible that the person they copied this from was only able to use the first three gates. He sighed in resignation, muttering under his breath, I guess that explains why Kaya could only open so few gates. But despite the incomplete nature of the scroll, Renjiro's resolve remained firm. It doesn't change anything. I already planned on consulting Duwei about this. He nodded to himself, feeling more assured as he continued perusing the various jutsus that lined the shelves of the first floor. He carefully weighed each scroll, wondering which ones would best complement his style. His eyes lingered on some of the more powerful and dangerous techniques. This is just the first floor, Renjiro thought, glancing around the room. So it makes sense that I wouldn't find something like Izanagi here. They are probably on the lower floors. I need to see if I can exchange my seals for contribution points and get them before the next Shinobi War. The fact that I can regenerate my Sharingans means that I will be pseudo-immortal. After a few more minutes of searching, he found two additional Jutsu that piqued his interest. The first was the Multi-Shadow Clone Jutsu, a technique that was infamous for its chakra consumption, but equally known for its tactical versatility. The second was a more obscure technique psycho Denshin. Renjiro's Sharingan scanned the scroll carefully, and he let out a small hum of interest. I'm glad the multi-shadow clone Jutsu is here, he thought. While I'm not sure if I can handle the chakra consumption considering I do not have tailed beast chakra like Naruto, all I can do is hope that I'll be able to pull it off. The Psycho Denshin, on the other hand, 
was a technique with a different appeal. It was originally an ANBU jutsu, designed to delve into a target's memories, alive or dead. The scroll detailed how the original version of the technique required a special tool to assist the process, but the Yamanaka clan's Inoichi had modified it, allowing the user to sift through someone's memories with their own chakra, bypassing the need for a tool entirely. Renjiro's lips curled into a small, predatory smile as he read further. They say it's difficult to use this jutsu on someone who's alive since they can form a mental resistance towards it, he thought, recalling the rumors surrounding the technique. But if the target is dead, like Ohashi, well, that changes things. The knowledge he could gain from Ohashi's memories could be invaluable. Especially since Lady Momo told him that his chances of learning Senjutsu were very slim. It's a good thing Ohashi is dead, he mused. I'll go through his memories in due time. After spending several more minutes reviewing the jutsus he had chosen, Renjiro gathered the scrolls and made his way back to where Toshiaki stood at the entrance of the library. The elder Achiha regarded him with an inscrutable expression as Renjiro presented the scrolls. Toshiaki-sama, Renjiro said, I've selected three jutsu I'd like to learn, the Eight Gates Technique, the Multi-Shadow Clone Jutsu, and Psycho Denshin. Toshiaki raised a single brow as he glanced at the scrolls Renjiro held. Interesting choices, he remarked before looking at a parchment before him. Toshiaki's eyes swept through the parchment, and after a moment, he turned back to Renjiro. These jutsu are fairly inexpensive, considering their complexity. I'll deduct 4,000 contribution points from your total. Renjiro blinked in surprise, raising an eyebrow. 4,000 points? That seems cheaper than I expected, he said, his voice trailing off into thought. Toshiaki's eyes twitched as he smirked slightly thinking, This boy, does he know how hard it is to get contribution points? Nevertheless, Toshiaki was prudent enough not to reveal his views. You're left with 13,000 contribution points now, the elder informed him. The eight gates technique is worth 2,000 points, while the other two are a thousand each. Cheap, but valuable if you know how to use them. Renjiro nodded slowly, absorbing the information. I still have 13,000 points left? He thought incredulously. That's more than I thought I'd have after this. What Renjiro didn't know, however, was that he was an anomaly within the clan. His work with the police force had earned him more contribution points than most Uchiha would accumulate in years of service. The investigating mission that he had helped solve earlier had allowed him to amass 17,000 points, a feat that many Uchiha on the police force could only dream of achieving in under a year. As Toshiaki continued with the transaction, he glanced back up at Renjiro. You are not permitted to leave with the scrolls, Toshiaki said firmly. You will have to use your Sharingan to memorize the details. This is a matter of clan security. Renjiro nodded. Understood, he replied, his Sharingan spinning as he committed every word, every diagram, every intricacy of the Jutsu to memory. It took a few minutes, but with his Dojitsu active, the process was far smoother than it would have been for most shinobi. Each line of the scrolls burned themselves into his mind with perfect clarity. Once he had finished memorizing the jutsus, Renjiro carefully rolled the scrolls back up and handed them to Toshiaki. Thank you, Renjiro said, his voice steady and resolute. Toshiaki simply nodded, though there was a glint of something akin to approval in his cold eyes. Good luck, Renjiro. Mastering those jutsu will not be easy. Renjiro offered a respectful bow before turning to leave the library. It was close to noon when Renjiro finally reached his house. He stepped inside, closing the door behind him quietly as the cool morning air filtered in through the open windows. Time to get to work, Renjiro murmured to himself as he prepared to begin mastering the jutsus. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.